We are back at Brintec today working on our MAD LS3 for our MAD E30. Now the heads have been sent away and also the rust repair has been taking place as well. I can tell you, welding some panels into some rusty floor of a BMW is very, very difficult. Yeah. I blasted some holes in there, man. That's right, there's plenty in there already. <laughs> but they were made by rust and oxidisation. Uh, so today we're going to be uh, buttoning our LS3 back up and we should have a finished engine ready to go back in the car when the car arrives here. Oh man, we're getting so close to these cam enhanced skids, aren't we? Absolutely. So engine back together, car should be here in the next couple of days, hopefully. And then it's, when that happens, engine back in car, dyno, skids. Boom. Let's get to it, Martin. All right. Heads have been serviced. Old valve springs are gone. Shiny new ones are in there. And now we are going to be able to put our mad LS3 back together. Our heads have had the uprated valve springs installed and the head checked over and now they're ready to slap back onto our block. We've also got new lifter trays and head gaskets and of course new lifters. These can be installed into the plastic trays and then oiled up and inserted into the block. Head gasket! Our new head gaskets are in place so the heads can be refitted. We've got some new bolts to hold the heads down which need to be tightened using a torque wrench. They are lubed up with grease and then we can wind them in, either with hand tools if you've got plenty of time, or you can use power tools but set them to minimum so they don't apply meaningful torque to the bolts. The bolts are tightened to a specified torque setting to seat them and then the torque wrench mode is changed to angle and we can have two more cracks at it. This is a fancy workshop grade torque wrench with torque and angle mode, but you can buy angle adapters to convert simpler torque wrenches or just use air mats. It's a good idea to mark each bolt once you've tightened it to make sure you don't lose track of where you're up to. And most importantly, remember to put on your favourite song with a mad 80s guitar solo. So this here is the factory push rod that we removed from the LS and that is getting replaced with these. Which are some upgraded aftermarket um, push rods. They are stronger, lighter, and it is possible to bend these things. I've seen it. They go burp, and they go really wrong. This connects the cam to the top of the motor to the valve. And this one here has an integrated ball joint in the top rather than being a separate thing. It's made of a stronger material of which we don't know what it is, but we will call it Dog metal. Push rhodium. <laughs> Push rhodium. Uh, and, um, and it's thicker wall as well, so that gives it more rigidity so in its erectness. We just, we just dip each end in the greasy stuff and then install them in, and away we go. With our lifters, push rods and heads installed, we can turn the engine over by hand and make sure the valve train is moving correctly. Then our oil pump can go back onto the crank and the timing cover reinstalled. We can then 
then flip the engine over and reinstall the oil pickup and sump. Rocker covers can go on and then we can drop the intake manifold back into place. LS is back together and now upgraded with a performance cam for bigger, better skids. So next we've got to get our little car back here so we can slap this back in. We've got the it water pump and car. it is a little car. It is a little car. Yeah, with a big engine, which is the best combo ever. So we've got to put our water pump and balancer and stuff back on, but and then goes back on the table and back into the vehicle. Yep. But our cam upgrade is done. Our rocker covers are back on, our intake's back on. It's looking like an LS again. It's a fairly detailed process, really, when you think of a cam, you think pull an old one out, put a new one in, but it's actually getting access to that that yeah. kind of takes the time. And doing the appropriate upgrades on the way so you've got the right supporting mods so that the cam can do its thing. So, next time you see us, car back here, engine in. Our car's arrived back from the panel shop and it's time to dump this fat engine back into the engine bay. We're getting the subframe out onto the rolly trolley wheelie thing and slapping the engine back into its mounts. Then we can install the flywheel and clutch. Using a torque wrench and yes, some thread locker is a good idea too. Our exhaust headers can go back on and the head studs tighten with a torque wrench. The gearbox can then be delicately placed onto the back of the engine and the bell housing bolts re-tightened. The rust repairs that were done down here are, are absolutely beautiful. It looks amazing looks and factory. no longer will you be doing the Freddie Flintstone on the dyno <laughs> by putting your feet actually through the footwell of the car. It looks fantastic. Or getting a toasted foot from the dyno and the header that's right near there. Uh, the engine bay's looking really good. Um, we are just about ready to put our engine back in with its bad cam and its gearbox has been installed. So we're going to uh, lift the car up, put the engine on the trolley thing and then lower the car back down. Same as what we did before. If you feel like you've seen it before, it's because you have. So we're going to snap through this super quick and get it done. The moral of the story potentially is that if you're LS swapping your car, throw the game in first. Could because the rest of this is exactly the same, isn't it? But see, if it weren't for our rusty floor, we might not have a cam. Well, we wouldn't even have a car, would we? Well, maybe not. Um, anyway, let's put the car up. Let's get the engine. Mad, I'm Let's getting excited. Let's do it. Imminent skids. We've given our brake booster a cosmetic birthday and we'll replace the master cylinder also. The accessory belt can then be puzzled back together and the tensioner released back into place.
Then it's a delicate dance of hoisty uppy and car downy until the subframe and engine line up with the chassis rails. Then the subframe can be bolted back in and the gearbox cross member reattached. We noticed last time we were putting the engine in that some of the bolts uh, that connect the cross member up to the chassis, just a bit old and a bit scungy and like some of them were wet from where the, we had the issue with the brake fluid and all that. So I actually just went and got some genuine replacement BMW bolts. So we're putting brand new ones in. Um, we'll wind them into the car and we'll have nice new stuff. Martin, while we're at it, we're doing a brake upgrade. We are doing a brake upgrade. Wellwood brake upgrade front and back. So while you guys are fan dangling with the engine, um, I'm getting rid of these uh, brakes. Ready for an epic upgrade. Why are we doing a brake upgrade? Because V8. That's why stock brakes are not going to hack it. Bigger brakes are always a good idea when you've got a more powerful engine. We haven't added any significant weight to the car, but we are way more likely to drive it fast, especially on the track. We're also going to replace the master cylinder, so that's the old one. Um, we think our leak problems came from back here somewhere, so it is easier a lot of the time you can rebuild them, but it's easier a lot of the time just to get a new one, which is that. So I'm just going to transfer the tank across and then whack it onto our booster. Hey Martin, where should we put that? <laughs> In the recycling con receptacle. Oh, sorry, mate. So the brakes that actually come on the E30 for the factory are perfectly fine and suitable for the kind of power that the car was originally designed to make. But of course now it's making more power. And we've been saying for years, if you're going to make your car faster, you've got to enhance the other supporting parts of the car as well. That of course includes the brakes. So Lawrence, these here are off the shelf components. So this is a Willwood brake kit. So we've got a front caliper, uh, nice and big and black. Um, and rear caliper rotors, but we've also got some custom -y bits over here. So can you run through what's going on over here? Yeah, so this is a, we call it a, a rotor hat. So that's a front one that we make to suit the E30 hub profile. Yep. So that's got our four stud holes in it. And we bolt that to a rotor outer, which is in here. So yep. we'll rip this out of the box real quick. So we've prepared that earlier just to save a bit of time, but yeah, nice. that's ready just to slot straight on the car. Uh, and on the caliper, if we pull that out of the box, I believe, yeah, so this one's what we call a, a radial mount, I believe, that's got the ears on it, and then yep. you can get axial mount where the bolts go through, and that's just a, a difference that you can buy. Yep. Again, it's just a generic six-pot caliper, uh, or six-piston caliper, um, and we've got a bracket Which somewhere. Which is heaps, heaps for this car. Heaps, yeah. Yep. So we've gone to a 300mm rotor, up yep. from a 260. So it's all about leverage. If you're further away from the hub centre, yep. then you less force to stop the wheel and that's the idea of the brake upgrade really. Do you think this would fit a Honda? We've gone for this aftermarket option so we can leave the rest of the drivetrain and hubs as they are. So these rotors are directional, there's arrows on them pointing to which way they're meant to go. It is not this way so that one is for the other side. Another solid option for brake upgrades is items from a better or newer version of the model. There aren't a great deal of choices for this model of car unless we change the hubs and stud pattern, which also means changing a bunch of other parts like the drive shafts. And this may end up being less economical than the setup we've got, even though the parts themselves may be cheaper. The front discs fit without having to cut the dust shields, but the back needs to be modified. They can be removed completely, but we've chosen to trim the lip off with an angle grinder. Then the rear discs fit straight on the hub, and using the adapters, the calipers can be installed and then we can throw on some braided lines. So for the Willwood brake kit to fit on our E30, it does need these brackets to convert the calipers. So there's a larger bracket for the front and a smaller bracket for the back. Uh, Lawrence, can you tell us a little bit about the brackets and how they work? Yeah, sure. So as I was saying before, these are just an off-the-shelf generic caliper. So all we need to do is make a profile bracket that picks up these generic lug holes and converts it back to the factory studs that are on the hubs up here. And that allows us just to pop this straight on like this. And then we just put the two factory bolts in and it's on. And it's done. Yeah, and you've got the front one there, so we'll do that one next and yeah, That's it's easy. Awesome. Uh, we've gone around the whole car now and changed uh, to new braided lines. Uh, there were some braided lines on there from last time, except uh, they're slightly different lengths now because the calipers are different sizes. So um, I would call that a complete brake upgrade. Mm -hmm. 
on the E30 are done. Everything we're doing now is stuff we have done before, plumbing everything back in, just basically restoring it back to how it was. Uh, new master cylinders in there, everything is tightened up. Put the new booster, plumb that all in. Um, so we're looking pretty good. Bit of plumbing, bit of wiring, turn the key, it should drive, it'll drive, right? Yeah. It should drive yeah. on the tune that's in it, and then the, we go and put it on the dyno, we should see the benefits of our hard work. The E30 has fuel, we have bled the brakes, we've put coolant in it, and I've turned off the injectors so that now we can give it a crank. Oil pressure wasn't coming up. I think it's because I actually got the fittings wrong on the oil filter. Good reason to always check, because it can be something as simple as that. Yeah. Oh, oil pressure, happy now. What I'm doing here is monitoring the oil pressure, but also keeping the revs at about 1500. That's to help pump the lifters up. But as you can see, a whole lot of smoke and other stuff is coming out. There's a lot going on. The E30 is done and ready to drive to the dyno. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Just did a quick Wi-Fi with Dave from Haltech and he just made it idle better. But actually all the numbers are fine to just sort of baby it there. I'm not gonna drive it like an idiot. It is very tempting with an LS3 powered E30 to do so, but no. I'm just gonna take it over to the dyno, get a tune in it, and then, instead about cleaning this car up a bit, that's what I'm actually quite excited about. There's just little bits and pieces of stuff that make turn a car into a nice car, like put carpet in there, now there's no hole in the floor. Um, sort out the seats and the door trims and just like little missing bits and pieces. The car is pretty clean overall, but there's still stuff that's missing. Um, yeah, and we'll have a pretty awesome cruiser of a BMW. Dino time, let's go. Aside from the idle being a little bit grumpy, the car drove fine and using the Haltec dash, I was able to keep a close eye on important data readouts like oil pressure and coolant temp. Scott, also known as Tuning Fork, has offered to lend his page upping skills to get the engine management dialed in perfectly for our cam upgrade. I always try and find like something little to stand on. Because I, I just don't want the comments. Yeah, there's to... a rubber thing there that's probably real dangerous to stand on. Yeah, because then the comments are not just wall to wall. Scott, he's taller than everyone. It's like, yes, we, we know. Yeah, look at that. Same. Doesn't bother you, does it? Nah. <laughs> I'm definitely not standing on a wheel chock. No, I'm just grown. Back with the E30, it's had a cam upgrade. Yeah, good uh, choice. Aside from that, not much has changed. A few little wiring things just to sort out, just little mm. niggly problems. Uh, but it drives fine. It's very, very bitey and towy and wants to go. Right. Like okay. it's very snappy, but that's partly gear ratio, I know. But in, in terms of what we're doing today, which is to retune for our new cam, what happens when you put a new cam in a car and then you bring it back to a dyno? Well, it, it is going to be a retune because all the fueling and all the ignition is going to be different. Mm. The idle control strategy is going to be different now. Even the cold start stuff will be different as well. Yep. Um, mate, by putting a camshaft in an engine like this, you've just let it breathe now. So yeah. it's as simple as that. We've yep. got more airflow, so now we need to put the right amount of fuel in and free up a little bit of ignition timing so that it'll make the extra power to suit the airflow. So cam, whether it's a cam change in an LS or yep. you've gone and changed your cams in your overhead cam, double overhead cam motor, basically same kind of thing? Same, same, it doesn't matter. So as, while we're changing that cam profile, if you've got dual overhead cam, if mm. you've got quad overhead cam mm. that are fully variable, yep. or whether you've got a single one in the middle of this thing with the sticks that with push the sticks on the side the of it. Or, bit at the top with the thing. And it, they're all, at the end of it, yep. some are more efficient than others, yep. but then at the end of it, they're all doing the same thing. So if we change the profile, tune changes. What does the Haltech do to help make this easier? Because when we spoke about, I was able to drive the car here, which is awesome, right? So just checking some idle and, and being gentle on it. What is the Haltech doing in the background to make that possible? So to do that, 
when we're here, I set up all the knock control stuff. Yes. I set up all of the, the long-term learning stuff. So it's looking at the air to fuel ratio coming out the tailpipe. Mm -hmm. I've got a whole bunch of targets in there that are set up. So I want the engine to run at a certain air to fuel ratio yes. across all the RPM points, across all of the throttle positions yep. and across all the barometric pressures. Mm -hmm. And then I get the system to look at that. If it's not doing what it's told or if it's not meeting those targets, we can open up those bounds a little bit mm -hmm. so that when you do put a cam in or do something at home, as you're driving it to the shop, it'll be doing corrections. It'll be coming back to those targets yes. for us. So, look, you wouldn't want to go and put it on a racetrack. No. But awesome to be able to drive it to the, well, to the dyno. Well, saves hundreds of dollars in trailers or yeah. tow trucks just being able to you know, gently drive it and also, you know, break it in, make sure everything's working well. It's a good point. to Even yeah. just to start it and get it idling and get heat it up, make mm -hmm. sure there's no oil leaks and stuff mm -hmm. before you tow it across town. So last time we had this car on the dyno, it made 258, 260 kilowatts around that number. Now obviously a lot of information out there, an LS3 makes this amount of power at this RPM on this day in this car. Uh, we have some limitations in our engine bay in terms of space and packaging, so mm -hmm. our headers have to go around steering racks and mm -hmm. which limits the size. So potentially our restriction is in our exhaust, the intake is big and mm -hmm. huge and all that. Um, the rest of the engine is, seems to be happy. So that could be where we are going down a little bit in power, but I would say even half this power in this car would be heaps. Yeah. Would be and great, so. And remembering how much grunt it's got as yeah. well. It's got heaps of torque down low, so mm. it feels like it's got more power because at two and 3,000 RPM, when yeah. you're normally waiting for the boost to turn up, yep. it's already on. It's already there, and mm. rear-wheel drive. So mm. it's one of the fastest feeling cars I've ever driven in terms of like how aggressive it is, <laughs> and a lot of fun. So I think today we just get the benefits of you know letting the engine breathe a bit better. Yes, we might find some more power. I hope we find a little bit more power there. I don't think we're gonna be breaking any records, but I think we should see a nice little increase, a nice little smooth power curve. And this mad E30 will be ready to do mm. some driving. From about 3,600 3, RPM, below yep. about 3,600 RPM, yep. pretty similar to Same. what we had. Hasn't really lost any grunt, everything's... Yes. And I can see that as well in the fuel map because down there where this cam's not as efficient as the other, as the factory cam was, yep. we've pulled had to pull a little bit of fuel out because we've got less airflow. Yeah. But then up the top, I've had to put more fuel back in because oh, we've got really? more airflow. Oh, cool. Scotty is happy with the tune and the car does sound amazing, but he reckons there might be a few more kilowatts hiding under that reverse bonnet. <laughs> Up she goes. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I reckon if it sits Shame the bonnet doesn't go the other way because then it would be really good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Alright, let's, let's tighten it up and do a power run. to make. Um, wow. Mm. 332. Mm. So cold air intakes do work then. A cold air <laughs> intake could be a thing on this yeah. particular car. Because there's yep. not a lot of room where the air filter is because yep. again, engine it's, bay limitations. It's just so hot in this and car, that's cramped. all there is to it. Yeah, and with the bonnet mm. shut, it's trying to draw that yeah. hot air in. Cool, that, I mean, what that tells me is I need to try and work out a way to get some nice yeah. cold air into it, right? You might. I was maybe you might end up with one of the one headlight with the nice mesh. Remember them? Yes. Yeah. That was a rally Datsun thing. That could do it. How interesting. Mm. Well, I mean, look, the car just made 332 well, kilowatts, 445 horsepower. That's amazing. Let's go back to back. No muck. It's actually it'll be pretty heat soaked now. Yeah. Okay. So it does.
That's amazing. Yeah, that's the number. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we can compare our air temp over the two runs. So what we've got down here is we've started down here, 33 degrees Celsius is where that run started. Yep. That last one I did, I really gave it a hard time before we yeah. ran it up. So there's no market that was sort of making 50 and 80 kilowatts, yes. loading up and down to heat it. Like you'd drive it and then yeah. give it a hit. Then give it a hit, it made 328 kilowatts wow. or 440 horsepower. Big difference. The run started at 1400 RPM, 33 degrees Celsius. Yep. Then, as we revved it, we finished at 6800 RPM, 33 degrees Celsius, which is the air temperature in the room today. Yeah, cool. Where we're sitting up nice and high. Yeah. And so that's that's yeah. the run that made the big power. Now we'll that's go back to look power. at the, basically the baseline yeah. where the engine's shut and the air temp so I'll air set up take where it normally this is. This screen exactly the same. So, okay, so that last one. Oh, wow. Started the run, 1400 up, exactly the same, yep. but it was 44 degrees when we started. Oh wow, big difference. Interestingly, it went down a tiny bit, three and a half grand, it went down to 42 degrees, so Suck it probably started air. pulling a bit of air through mm -hmm. and it got a difference. Then it just got out of control, so the, in, the engine bay temperature started to skyrocket here. Yep. And by the end of the run, we're pulling in 50 degree inlet air temps. This is one of my favorite things about putting a car on a dyno. <laughs> And you yeah. can't do that on the road How easily. How would you ever know? Yeah, and yeah. you can just see it. Like, that's so cool. And it gives me mm. a good mm. project, really, mm. doesn't it? To go, hey, do you want an extra 22 yeah. kilowatts? So Make, the, give it some cold air. The question now is, I'll just cut a hole right no, there. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll drive it home with 306, All right. All right. and maybe I'll work out a way to get some cold air into the bay. <laughs> Scotty, thanks so much, man. That's been Mate. highly educational, interesting as always. And I'm excited to drive this. Pleasure. You have got a thing. hell of a car. This yeah, thing rad. will be a beast to, on the track. Yeah. I, man, this will be up there. Well, skids is what you really mean, isn't it? For well, doing donuts. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> hey, you know what? For any any sort yeah, of motor racing. Exactly. Get in the dirt in this thing. No. No. It's too clean, mate. Yeah, all right, all right. Mad. Lunchtime. You're the best. Thanks, man. Pleasure. Thanks Love for it. coming.